this is Carla, and welcome back to There Might Be Cupcakes. April is a happy and sad month for me. It is the month of my best friend's birthday, which makes me extremely happy. For new you listeners, Joshua and I have been friends since 10th grade, and yes, I am now 48 years old, and he will be soon. <laughs> the other reasons April is fraught and full for me is that April 13th is the anniversary of the death of my younger brother, Eric. Again, for those of you who are new listeners, uh, he is my only sibling, and he died when I was nine, and he was seven. Like me, he also had an autoimmune disorder. He actually developed Addison's disease in the womb, which is quite rare. I choose to celebrate his life in April. For this reason, um, Prince's song, Sometimes It Snows in April, has always been really special to me. It's such a, a unique expression of grief. Prince was such an amazing writer. But yeah, there I go. I digress as I always do. One of the reasons I have a podcast. <laughs> and the final reason? It's the anniversary month for the podcast. Episode one, Poe and Carla and Cupcakes aired April 28th, 2017. And bunches and bunches and bunches of downloads later. And shocking positions on Apple Podcasts. Last week, I was at 227 on the personal journals chart. Thank you so much. I'm still blown away by that. And three years later, it's April again. I haven't published as much as I want due to my health. And I have episode sequels that I owe you. The follow-up to the Sweetbriar episode, episode 39. And the third episode in the Third Mothers slash Suspiria series. All about witchcraft and motherhood and Carl Jung. But I am still very proud of this little venture. This little one-woman venture. Many cupcakes have been created and found, I think. The very first thing I ever said on this podcast was a Poe quote. Believe only half of what you see and nothing that you hear. <laughs> Poe has always been a huge part and parcel of this podcast, weaving in and out and hiding behind the digital drapes peeking out with his mournful big black eyes as I read and marvel at cool facts and dive down rabbit holes like Alice. So my plan for the special anniversary month while we're all sheltering in place and admittedly anxious is to return to my roots and coax him out from behind the velvet drapes to sit with me. I'm going to publish several short, some very, very short episodes to hopefully distract and entertain you and to thank you for every single beloved download. I am a very quirky sort, quite eccentric, as you know, and this is an unusual podcast and very uneven in subject matter and schedule, and yet somehow you still love it and me, and I love you for it. Thank you. Be safe. Stay at home right now for your and everyone else's safety, and let me read to you. These short episodes will not only be post stories and poems, but also other horror gems by his contemporaries. Hopefully, I'll be able to introduce you to something new you like. Who knows? So sit back with some tea, coffee, cocoa, cold glass of water, maybe a glass of wine. Put up your feet, close your eyes. And take a deep breath. Remember, I used to be a counselor. Inhale for the count of four. Hold it for the count of four. And release it to the count of five. And let me take you somewhere else. For a couple of minutes. The Oval Portrait by Edgar Allan Poe. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance, rather than permit me, in my desperately wounded condition, to pass a night in the open air, was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which has so long frowned upon the Apennines Mountains not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. We established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. And these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, 
In these paintings, my insipid delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternatively, to the contemplation of these pictures and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and not reaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturbing my slumbering valet, I placed it as so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly and closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for the for those sh so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw a right I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed and moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work, nor the immortal beauty of the countenance, which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame, must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained for an hour, perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute lifelikeness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. Because of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art, she a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour, and from day to day, 
and he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride who pined visibly to all but him yet she smiled on and still on uncomplainingly because she saw that the painter who had high renown took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak and in sooth some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words as of a mighty marvel and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well but at length as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion there were admitted none into the turret for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work and turned his eyes from canvas merely even to regard the countenance of his wife and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sate beside him and when many weeks had passed and but little remained to do save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp and then the brush was given and then the tint was placed and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought but in the next while he gazed he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and crying with a loud voice this is indeed life itself turned suddenly to regard his beloved she was dead. The Oval Portrait is one of Poe's shortest stories. It was published in 18, April 1842, 178 years ago this month, when he was 33 years old. It plays upon Poe's idea expressed in his essay, The Philosophy of Composition, that, quote, the death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. Dario Argento, the director of the Three Mothers movies, Suspiria, Inferno, and The Mother of Tears, the subjects of episodes 51 and 53, felt similarly, though his expression of this idea was much more arguably misogynistic and much more vulgar. Uh, I've linked an interesting essay about it in his works in the show notes. This story was originally published as Life and Death earlier in 1842, in Graham's Ladies and Gentlemen's Magazine. This version included an intro that expounded upon the protagonist's opium ingestion to alleviate pain stemming from an injury, which is why he was bedridden. Poe edited out these paragraphs because it gave the feeling of the story being a hallucination and nothing more. The version I read to you was then published as The Oval Portrait on April 26th of that year in the Broadway Journal. The image for this episode is the illustration for this story for Graham's Magazine by Jean-Paul Lorraine. I'll post a full copy of this image on the website entry for this episode and the podcast Facebook page. Some fun literary trivia before I sign off. This story not only influenced Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, The Birthmark, but also directly influenced one of my favorite classical novels, Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. That's so cool. I hope you've enjoyed this foray into a not as well known post story. I'll be back shortly with another story or poem. Take care of yourself and each other and please stay well. Mm-hmm.